All right, it's 11.02, so I think we're going to get started. There are not a lot of us here in person, but several joining us online. Hello and welcome. Um, my name is Melissa Bowles Terry. I'm the director of the Faculty Center and very happy to uh, welcome you here. Hello, come on in. Great. Um, so I'm very grateful to have some students here to speak to us today. And that is, that is the plan. We're just gonna go straight into the student panel after I tell you just a couple of things here. Um, those of you who are joining us online, while the panel speaks, you can put your questions and comments in the chat box, and then you'll be called on to unmute yourself and share your question. So we're in a high flex room where we have a camera and microphones, and we'll be passing this microphone among the panelists and um, just welcome you to participate. I have some prepared questions, but then we can go to your questions as well for the audience. And um, also please note that we are recording this to share later with folks who couldn't be here today. So with that, I'm gonna pan over to the panel and we will introduce ourselves and just go ahead and get started. And I'll stop sharing too, so you just have the view of the panel. Okay. All right. All right, so um, I'm gonna start with our students who are joining us on Zoom, actually. We'll go with Abe and then Nathan, and then I'll pass the mic along the row right here to the panelists who are here in person. And I just ask you to tell us your name, your major, your class standing, and your favorite thing about Las Vegas and or UNLV. So we'll start with Abe. Yes, thank you so much, Melissa. Um, and thank you for including all of us here today. It really, really does make the difference in um, bridging that gap and communicating between us. So that's fantastic. My name is Abraham Lugo. Um, I'm the sitting student body vice president for the undergraduates at UNLV. I'm currently a senior majoring in political science with a minor in public policy. And really one of my favorite things, no, my favorite thing at UNLV is definitely um, all of the people. Um, I love every last person that I get to meet and work with. And every single day I meet a new person that just impresses me and shows me something new. and. Um, there's there's always something to take in um, as a lesson to reflect back to your community at UNLV, and that's that's definitely my favorite thing. Awesome, thank you, Abe, and thanks to Abe for helping me round up students. Awesome, amazing students to be on this panel. So thanks, Abe. Uh, Nathan. Yeah, so um, I'm Nathan Bugash. I'm currently a piano performance major, and I'm a senior. Um, and I think my favorite thing about Las Vegas is definitely like the nature aspect of Las Vegas, which sounds kind of counterintuitive when you think about like the heat of Las Vegas, but I absolutely love going out to Red Rock up Mount Charleston or the quick three hour drive to Zion. All of that is just awesome. And that's what I love. Thank you. Now I will pass the mic down this table. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, so my name is Ava Carino. I'm a double major in history and Asian American studies and also a film minor. Um, I'm currently a senior year-wise, but credit-wise, I think I might be a junior. Even my advisors can't make up their minds. Mm -hmm. um, my favorite thing about UNLV is always the food. I love the fact that I can go to Chinatown at two o'clock in the morning and get the best Vietnamese food that I've had. But on a more personal note, I've met some of the most amazing people I've ever had the chance of meeting here in Las Vegas that I can definitely call lifelong friends, some of which are in the room right now. Um, and also like just being, CCSD gets a lot of bad rap, but there's a lot of good teachers there as well. So I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Noor. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Melissa and Abe as well. So my name is Noel Pendrillo, and I'm one of the sitting senators for the new NLB CSUN for the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, my major is philosophy with a concentration in law and justice alongside a minor in global entrepreneurship. When it comes to my class standing, I'm a junior as of the moment. When it comes to my favorite thing about Las Vegas and UNLV as a whole would mainly just be the culture of the campus and just the city. Uh, when it comes to Las Vegas, I, I love the lights. When it comes to UNLV, I just love the diverse culture being one of the most diverse institutions in the, in the nation. I had siblings around here, so I grew up on this 
campus since I was a little kid. So that would definitely be my uh, favorite thing. And I'll be passing it off to Kayla. Thank you, everyone. Uh, I hope everybody's having a great day. My name is Kayla Marshall. I am a business marketing major and a, I have a minor in global entrepreneurship. I am currently a senior or no, I'm currently a junior. I wish I was a senior. <laughs> um, I'm currently a junior. And my favorite thing about Las Vegas is that it is a big little city. I've grown up here my entire life. And it's always interesting to me that I will go to different sides of towns and still be able to see someone that I recognize from my past or that I've met in a store or like they know my parents. It's different interactions like that that make it a really great city because everyone here is very nice and approachable in many different ways across the entire city. And I can say that is also reflected in the UNLV campus. If I see someone that I met freshman year, they're always open to rekindling a conversation. It's never like I'm meeting strangers. So that's, those are some things about me. Awesome, I'm actually gonna have you keep the mic there. Um, hopefully you can still hear me. I'll talk loud to our ceiling tile. Um, I'm gonna ask all of our student panelists to tell us about great teaching at UNLV. So what is the best thing an instructor has done to make the classroom feel like an inclusive place where you can do your best learning? And we'll just start with Kayla and pass it back uh, this way. All right, awesome. I think one of the best things a professor has done for me is allowing the classroom lectures to be more of discussions. So they're more student-led than professor-led. So a lot of the times they would ask us to summarize what we read or um, talk about our favorite things that we learned last class. Things like that make it better for me because it kind of forces me to participate <laughs> and kind of engage with what we're learning. And I have found out that those have been some of my best classes the most entertaining classes, hearing what my other classmates have to say, and it made it easier to interact with them when we had group projects because it wasn't like I never heard their voice before. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and answer that question as well. Kind of bouncing off of what Kayla said, I would suggest the same for me as well. Personally, for me, when it comes to being in class, it's difficult to focus a lot of the time when it's really lecture-based, and some of my classes are two to three hours, so I just sit there and get tired, but when it's very discussion-based and very interactive, like a lot of my classes this semester, it's been very engaging for me. It makes me stay on top of not only my readings and my assignments, but it also just makes me feel like I'm actually in a classroom getting to know not only my peers, but getting to know my professor. It's honestly a sense of comfort and really helps me focus and helps me study hearing, you know, the thoughts of my peers on the readings and on, on the assignments and topics, as well as my professor. Rather than sitting down and being in a lecture for one to two hours of just my professor, consistently talking without it being discussion-based. When it's more interactive, I feel like that helps me with my notes, that helps me with my assignments and with my quizzes, and leads to me being a more a successful student. So I'm gonna name drop some professors because I think y'all should know them. So from ethnic studies, I started out my freshman year thinking it's exactly like high school. And I'm like, okay, it's exactly like AP classes. You go sit, Socratic seminar, you read about old dead white men who don't reflect your experiences at all. So I started off taking Asian American studies one or two with Dr. Mark Padunpat, and he essentially is like, throw everything you knew out the window. I'm going to have curriculums and readings based on your experiences, based on your ethnicities. And with that, I finally felt seen in a classroom. Um, and that's one of the biggest things. I also realized that for the longest time, I was more obsessed with the workload than actually getting to know the teachers and the professors on campus. Um, me, myself, my, my main goal in life is to become an ethnic studies professor. So this is near and dear to my heart. And my professors, they've always kind of are like, okay, this is exactly what we're doing by the week, for the week, minute by minute. Um, and that really helped me stay on, on track. They were always so personable. They're always just they have an open door policy. So if the door is open, come right in. You can talk about whatever you need to talk about. And they have always been so inclusive of our experiences, both good and bad on campus. And other professors, it's just sometimes you just need comedy in there. Um, Keenan Diaz from the phone department, he always adds comedy into his lectures when they're like four hour lectures. Um, and he's like, yeah, I know I don't wanna be here either, but I'm getting paid to do this. Um, and also Dr. Constancio Onardo from Ethnic Studies Department, he 
makes it his goal to ensure that students lead the discussion. He'll be like, I'll make the topic, I'll make the questions, but students lead the discussion, which is so imperative because it's like, we're not being overlooked for what we went through. We're actually reading what we experienced and then able to talk about our own. So I think that's what is about great teachers. And obviously great teachers don't come from colleges and teach for American stuff like that. They come from experience and they come from bonding with the students. If you're able to bond with students, you're a great teacher. You, you got it in the bag right there. Great, thank you so much. It's all about the personal connections. Great, um, Nathan? Yeah, so I think I kind of have a unique experience in regards to this question. Just because I'm a music major, I'm required to have one-on-one -on -one lessons with my professor. And that's not something you usually see with other majors. I mean, you have, yeah, you have the office hours that you can go to and talk to your professor when you need to get help. But really, when I go in every week and I'm spending an hour and a half, two hours every single week with my professor, it really makes me realize, like, how much he cares about my learning and my growth. So that's... I mean, that's one aspect of being a music major, but also the other music classes, it's really helpful having small class sizes. Um, and in that regard, the professors, I'm kind of bouncing what Ava said, they're more personable and they're more caring about seeing every single student succeed because they don't have to worry about a whole lecture hall of 100 plus students. They're just worrying about, oh, the 15, 20 kids that are in their class. And it's a really cool experience when the professor kind of initiates um, like group work. Um, that's one thing I love because sometimes it's really hard doing everything by yourself. When you have other peers that are kind of struggling through the same, you know, classes and same situations that you're in, it's helpful having other people to rely on and other people that you can kind of get your work done with. So, yeah. Great, thank you. And Abe? Yes, everyone had amazing answers, so I have to find something creative to come out of. But um, I think um, definitely for me personally has been acknowledgement. And what I mean by that is acknowledgement of your individual identities can come out in different ways. One of my um, Spanish professors, something that I love, love, love about being in his classroom is that he asks questions that says, okay, where is everyone from? You know, because when we talk about Spanish, for example, that can be from a multitude of different backgrounds. And um, at that, that was just from the get-go. And at the very beginning, I said, oh, I'm from Venezuela. Um, and instead of, you know, going with um, what the majority, you know, and for example, in Las Vegas, the majority um, is the Mexican population. And a lot of the times I'm kind of just looped into that population when I'm from Venezuela. Now he, when he's like talking about examples or something, or he's giving a list of different kind of backgrounds, he always says Venezuela because he knows I'm in the room and present and that's where I'm from. Um, and I think that little little detail does make me feel much more included and seen in the classroom and that does make me want to participate a lot more and in that same kind of aspect I think saying your name I know professors have the struggle of having to go through so many different students and having to remember names is a big big task but when I'm in a classroom and I'm looking like I want to answer the question but I don't want to raise my hand and they go oh Abe what are you thinking? That makes me feel like, oh my gosh, you know my name, you know I'm here, you know I'm present, you want me to engage, I'll engage. And I think small little details like that may be subtle, but they are details that make all the difference. And I think when we're in these spaces, professors really become the example, you know, on how we in and ourselves on our campus are going to interact. So seeing professors talk about pronouns, talk about um, the different backgrounds and cultures and identities that are in the classroom and acknowledge them makes it so you feel like you can go around the UNLV campus and um, showcase who you are in your most significant light. And I think that's a very important part that is often overlooked. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up, Abe, because, I mean, knowing students' names, checking for pronunciation, making sure that you're calling them by their preferred name and preferred pronouns, um, and, and getting that right seems very small, but it does, it makes us all feel seen. Don't say, all your names are so hard to pronounce. I'm sorry if I mess them up. Just try your best. 
Yep. And just if you hear it a couple times, you'll you can get it. Um, awesome. Uh, okay. So next question from me is about what instructors don't know. What do you wish instructors knew about you, <laughs> about you, about your fellow students, anything that would help them do their jobs better? I'll pass it down again and then go online. So I think the biggest thing that we have to understand is you have to understand the demographic of your students. A lot of students, especially who are low income or uh, BIPOC individuals, they have a different experience than what other students may have. And definitely, like for example, when we go through trauma or collective trauma, um, especially what's, what's tomorrow, um, that can affect a lot of students. Um, and they, they need to understand that. And also, a lot of students are working multiple jobs um, and they have to be probably the sole caregiver of their homes. And, you know, they're trying to get an education. They're trying to break that intergenerational trauma. They're trying to break so many things and be kind of like, I will pass with my bachelor's in whatever major that may be. Um, and another thing that I quickly realized is that I don't think the same way as my peers think. I think kind of a little bit out of the box. So I'm very open about my mental health to my professors that I trust. And I say, hey, look, I have ADHD and your stuff is not ADHD friendly. I, like for example, I have professors who have lectures and I need closed captioning because I can't listen or I can't understand and comprehend what they're saying. And they're like, oh, I never thought of it that way. I never thought to implement closed captions. I never thought to make my Canvas page more ADHD friendly, where you can find everything easier. And usually a lot of professors, especially in my field, they kind of link the syllabus into the assignments. And then I'm like, when I click onto the assignments, it's like, there's no assignments to show. And I was like, no, I know I'm like three lessons behind. I know there's something here. Mm -hmm. um, and then another thing that a lot of students and also professors don't talk about, but it's kind of like an open secret is imposter syndrome. It's a really, really big thing. Imposter syndrome hits you from behind and you're like, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. I know exactly what I'm talking about. But there's that little voice in your head that just says, you, you don't know what you're talking about. You're writing so awful. Why, do you, why are you doing this in your leadership positions when you have no idea what you're doing? And being able to connect to professors who also understand that imposter syndrome is real, the best thing I've ever heard from a professor is, Imposter syndrome never goes away, but you learn how to deal with it. And sometimes you have to realize that you are the source and you have to, instead of fighting with it, you fight alongside with it. So, yeah. yeah. I'm still hoping someday that imposter syndrome will let, let me be. Yeah, yeah just so leave I, us. I just became faculty this semester, even though I was already teaching. Mm -hmm. I had imposter syndrome my whole PhD. Yeah. You're always questioning if you're like good enough. Mm -hmm. People are, if you made it that far. Um, yeah, still it doesn't go away. Yeah. It's still there. I know I'm, I'm, I earned my job, but yeah, that's the one thing I think hits us all and stays there. Yeah. Yeah. So I'll go ahead and touch upon this question and give my answer as well. I'd suggest the first thing, honestly, would be I'm looking at the papers in front of us. Some professors, in my experience, uh, essentially act like we know the information beforehand before we take the class. Uh, for me as a philosophy major, I've taken many philosophy classes and I've had professors expect me to know all sorts of things about ethics and Socrates and Aristotle, but I didn't study this stuff in high school. I didn't take a single philosophy class in high school. And I came to UNLV and talking to, to my professor saying, hey, I don't really know this. And you're saying that we, we know this already and you're not gonna teach it, but I'm paying you to teach me, essentially. I've had professors tell me, well, next time study in high school, I'm doing my job lecture in class. And at the end of the day, I'm always just like, well, I'm taking this class to learn about this, not be told I should know this already from high school when I did not study this and I'm coming here to learn. That made it really difficult on me on some classes when it came to assignments and quizzes of ex being expected to know this stuff and having to do my own research at home and study on my own. Aside from the classes, I'm already paying for out of pocket that weren't exactly benefiting me. I'm thankful to have met a lot of philosophy professors who were really inclusive uh, and really understanding of their students, like Dr. Sheila Bott of 
philosophy of law. She really breaks it down bit by bit, making sure you understand everything and isn't afraid to ask the, the students to really make sure they know and make sure they're learning and they're not confused. Aside from that, I would also suggest that I would just hope professors could maybe just learn to be more inclusive. What I ever kind of touched up on it and trying to figure out how to word it exactly the right way. But at the end of the day, you never know what someone could be going through at home. There's a lot of people who just don't open up to people. I'm that kind of person. I like to keep my things to myself and people close to me. And some of my classes have seven to nine textbooks. This semester included, and my professors are doing all of them at once, but they don't necessarily try to be as inclusive and flexible and expect you to have this done by class. And if you don't have it done, they're gonna dock you participation points at the end of the day. As a student who's taking other classes, having to read chapters for seven to nine textbooks for one class while working two jobs and doing other things can kind of be difficult on me as a student and always feeling like I'm being held to these such high standards when I'm coming to UNLV to really learn and be the best person I can be. So at the end of the day, it would honestly just be trying to be more inclusive of what students are going through. Try to be understanding and be flexible and be like, I know a lot of you can be working two jobs. Like Ava touched up on it. Some of you could be sole caregivers of your home. Some of you could be going through family issues or relationship issues with people close to you and you just don't have that time to commit to do all of this at once. And you just need some more flexibility to get things done, which would be a great way if student, if some professors could kind of essentially be a little more understanding of that aspect to increase graduation rates and make sure our dropout rates don't, you know, increase a little bit more. So at the end of the end of the day, it would essentially be those two things specifically. All in all, I've met some good professors at UNLV. I'm a junior now, but those are just, I guess, a few main highlights of my experiences up to this point and this last semester over these last few weeks as well that I just wish some instructor, instructors would take into some consideration, like Ava mentioned, because again, at the end of the day, you don't know what someone is going through. They can be smiling and be outgoing, but at home, they could be miserable. And you just need to be understanding and flexible when it comes to all sorts of academic things in your classes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I agree with everything that my panelists have said so far, but to basically sum up um, what I wish my professors knew is not to necessarily, well, just some preface. I'm just now learning that there's this thing called, you know, you can be in love with trauma. And I never understood this before. And I feel like, as for me, I come from a low income family. And of course, I'm trying to dig us and myself out of that. And I started to realize when working with my, um, my uh, therapist that there is this thing of loving struggle. I went to a magnet high school where I did take business classes. And I found myself complaining this year about how I feel like I'm not learning anything in my current ma um, business classes because I learned it already. And she said, well, wasn't that the point? Weren't you supposed to go to high school and get prepared so it's easier for yourself in college? So I found myself realizing like, oh crap, <laughs> I love to struggle. I love a really hard challenge. And that's not necessarily good for anyone's health. And so for me, when it comes to professors, I know that a lot of them came from the same situations that we came for before. So when we do have these family issues or these personal issues, a lot of the times, professors inadvertently could be like, well, I did it, so you should be able to do it. And that to me is like, you should want to make it easier for your students. There shouldn't be a glorification of students having to struggle in college because that's the college experience that everyone has had before. So I would ask my professors to not have any expectations of your students, just lower them completely and have a blank slate and Whatever student walks into the room, if they're dealing with something that you didn't know about or you have this high expectation of them to be mature and to be able to handle all these things and have good time management, I feel like I am a junior, but I have the maturity and the back aches of someone who has graduated already. <laughs> like everything is completely different. So when you lower those expectations, you allow your classroom to grow and as well, you grow with your students as well and with the circumstances that they bring to your classroom. Instead of the other way around where students have to work and pivot their lives to grow to your classroom that you have set off the bat. Yeah, Kayla, I think you made such a good point. Um, and uh, I think that there are instructors who see their job as like weeding students out, but hopefully we're moving more towards uh, sort of an ethos of meeting students where they are. Like our students come to us 
as human beings with complicated lives and backaches and <laughs> whatever else is going on. And it's our job to meet them in that place, not to say, well, you're not college ready and you're not college ready. So I'm writing you off, but it's our job to bring everybody in because they're our students. Um, I'm gonna go to Abe and then Nathan on this question about what you wish instructors knew. Yes, so mine is kind of in the same um, ballpark for what y'all have been talking about. But for me personally, I've always tried to be very involved. Um, I obviously right now I'm student body vice president. I've been in CSUN. Um, and so that comes with the common theme of being surrounded by people that are amazing, you know, a very good students. And I'm so glad to have such an amazing team. And that's where the imposter syndrome also kicks in, you know, and especially for me since a young age, I've always tried to be a very, very good student. I do consider myself a very good student. However, um, I've never had straight A's before. I've never been um, excelling in my classes. I really, really do struggle more when it comes to my academics, no matter how hard I try. And so um, something that I've realized a lot recently and kind of similar to um, what Nor mentioned is that a lot of the times, because some students are kind of interacting with the professor and speaking and showcasing their knowledge on a certain subject, the assumption that comes to the entire class is that the entire class is also on that exact same page and everyone is also... Sorry, I had to restart the recording. Thank you so much, Abe. And um, we'll go to Nathan, what you wish you, your faculty knew. Yeah, so I think this is a really good question. Um, definitely agree with what all my fellow panelists said. Those are all very, very true. Um, one thing I wanted to say is um, no one will ever know how you're feeling because they're not in your shoes. And that applies to students as to professors or professors to students anyone you you don't know what someone else is going through because you're not them <laughs> so that's just something I think professors and and students not not just professors I think professors and students should kind of understand that so if students are more understandable hey my professor might be having a bad day that might be why you know they're not their lecture is so boring or whatnot and then I would stu our professor should be more understandable like oh this student is you know sleeping in class maybe they have sleep insomnia and only got two hours of sleep last night and they're not able to you know function correctly in this class so it's being really more understandable and realizing that we're not all we're not always always aware of each other's situations even though when we are it's to the best that we can we can't fully be fully understanding of each other great thank you so much um, so I'm going to ask y'all one more question about campus resources and advising, and then uh, we're going to open it up to our attendees to ask you whatever they would like. So, um, and we'll start with uh, Nathan, then Abe this time and go down the panel. Um, so yeah, my last question for you all is tell us a bit about your experiences with advising, other campus resources. What do you wish that you had known about earlier? what's been most helpful to you, um, that sort of thing. Yeah, honestly, um, I have absolutely loved both of my advising centers since I'm in the Honors College and Fine Arts. I have two different advisors. My Fine Arts advisor is always helping me as much as she can. I schedule those appointments and we have a really great half an hour talk about what I need to do to graduate and be successful. So in that regard, it's been awesome. And same with the Honors advising, like, there's a lot of different requirements that you need for the Honors College, and that advisor has really just helped me and pushed me through making sure I'm on track to complete everything in a timely manner. Um, in regards to other resources I wish I knew about, this is going to be a uh, CSUN plug, but I, my first two years of UNLV, I did not utilize any of the resources that CSUN had to offer. Um, and we also advertise a lot of the resources. I know we are, we have a resource guide that kind of gives you a whole rundown of a bunch of different resources that just the campus has in general. And we had the orientation as freshmen about, oh, there's this resource, this resource, but it really just kind of went over my head. I didn't really realize that, oh, these are actually resources that can really, really help me. Just like, for example, the amount of scholarships that UNLV has to offer, like there's so much money sitting there that students can just kind of come up and grab. Um, but besides that, um, 
really just see Sun's resources in general is what I'll answer to that. Yes, fantastic question. Um, so for me personally, my experience, um, particularly with advising, has been a good one. There, I can't um, have any negative things to say. However, a lot of the times, especially because um, I went to CSN high school, so a lot of the times I've just kind of learned how to do things on my own. Um, so I think that attributes to a lot of other students as well in the sense that um, coming up with your graduation date, what classes you're going to take next, that's kind of like on your own account. Um, and so with that, I think definitely pushing students to go to advising is the biggest thing that you could do because with that comes, oh, I can do it myself, I can do it myself, and then you miss a credit and then you don't graduate when you want to graduate. So it's never a bad thing to go meet with your advisor. And I understand, trust me, I understand more than anyone that students can get very, very busy schedules, but um, just taking that time, it's on a walk-in basis. Now it's available online as well. Just pushing that would be fantastic. Um, and then I would really encourage y'all to get familiar with um, kind of all of the resources around campus. I know we have a lot of um, different organizations for different aspects. I know we have CAPS that kind of um, takes on mental health resources. I know that we in CSUN have also been funding different um, sectors of campus that will be helping with sexual misconduct, helping with um, kind of sexual assault, traumatic experiences within student life. Um, and I think familiarizing yourself with those is important because um, within the classroom you get interaction that is a little more consistent. So you see the same people a little more and you're able to kind of get different flags on whether some folks need help, whether it be in the classroom, whether it be with advising, whether it be with mental health. Um, we have so many different resources. And again, just like Nathan said, um, CSUN has just so many things. And if you ever are unsure of where to go to. Don't think that you can't reach out to us either just because we're the students. We are here to make sure that the students directly are being accounted for and have the access to resources that are available. And if they're not available, making resources so that there is available. Um, so if you ever have an idea, a concern, you don't know who to go to, please, please, please feel free to reach out or direct your students over to us because that's where we get paid for. So yeah. You can hear how intense Abe is about this. You're like tapping the table. We got it. Yep. <laughs> All right, Ava. So I have a very interesting experience with advising. So uh, full disclosure, I am a first generation college student in my family in America. I'm very proud of that. Um, the first one uh, getting my bachelor's in my immediate family, and I'm going to be the first woman ever getting my PhD in my family. So I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, with that being said, I got paired up with one of the worst advisors ever in my advising center and it's closing advising. And they're an amazing advising center. I just got paired up with somebody really bad. So my freshman year, I started off with seven classes. Only three of them counted. Then my next semester, I started off with eight classes and on my transcript, only three of them counted. My advisor never told me that I can withdraw, I can audit, I can drop. They never told me about that. So I was like, I was super behind in credit. So my sophomore year, I was like, oh God, I gotta take another seven classes just to try and catch up with everything. And I'm very thankful that I did have an advisor who was like, we'll do it step by step. Um, his name was Andrew Clark. He is, I think a CSN now, but he was an amazing advisor. Um, and I've had some other advisors too over the years. Um, but a funny story is that between finding my advisors I have right now, who I absolutely love to pieces, um, the advisors I had in between, they would look at my degree sheets and yes, that's an plural degree sheets and be like, I think this class might go for both, but I'm also a history major. So I couldn't take a lot of the, I couldn't take any of the history classes for my electives. And they're like, well, count here, but not there. So we got to find another class. And they just got to the point where they would literally print out my degree sheets and then give it to my director of uh, Asian American studies. And they're like, whatever classes he says, just tell us and you're good to go. So that's what I did for like two and a half years. Um, now that I have this amazing um, advisor at Wilson, she literally goes through and it's like, okay, we're going to play catch up, but you're good. You're good to go. Um, with that being said, like there's been so many campus resources that I use just 
being first generation, um, much like what Abe said about CAPS, I found out that CAPS actually has a limited number of sessions that you can go to. So while CAPS is an amazing resource to have, which I would highly, highly recommend to anybody, there's also a UNLV Center for Individual and Family Counseling, and it's open to both faculty and students. And for students alone, it's only $25. Um, and I think it's per year and you get literally unlimited sessions. You meet with your therapist once a week and every week and you get a new therapist like every academic year. So it's great. Um, another resource that I use a lot was the Anapizi program here on campus. I think it's located in SSCA, if I can remember. I've been able to do summer graduate research. I've been able to work with professors. I've been able to have my research published. I've done research about American imperialism and food studies, which has been amazing. Um, and then also one of the biggest campus resources uh, and near and dear to my heart is the Student Diversity and Social Justice. There's two locations, but currently we're in Student Union 309. And we've done events for all of the my marginalized students on campuses. That includes Black, Native American slash Indigenous, Appie May slash international and um, LGBTQIA. We've done uh, things like festivals, communities, parade of flags. We've done uh, black carpet. Um, and overall, it's great resources because not only uh, can you say, okay, well, I'm having mental health uh, issues. I'm having physical health issues. You can go down to the wellness center and literally every like third floor is the mental health and then the second floor is the physical health. And I use it so many times that the receptionist knows me by name now. Um, I don't know if that's a good or bad thing. I'm gonna take it as a good thing. Um, and then if you're ever feeling like isolated or like, you know, people don't really understand my ethnicity or what I've been going through, there are many resources on campus. I'm very, very glad that we're a diverse campus because I don't know what I would be doing at a PWI. <laughs> um, so you're never alone in these things. And there's always, it's not right in your face but sometimes you just randomly stumble upon them. So, yeah. Yeah, so I'll go ahead and uh, answer this question as well. So there's a few resources, firstly, that I think were very beneficial for me on campus, but first I'll just touch upon my experiences with the advising center. So I've been going to Wilson Advising, you know, I'm a COLA major, so obviously that's the advising center I go to. I've had a very good experience, uh, being honest. I've only had one bad experience, which was I believe in my sophomore year, uh, my advisor was not sure what philosophy classes I should be taking and was saying, I don't know what pre-law or philosophy classes you take because I'm a, doing a concentration in law and justice. And I ended up taking classes that didn't necessarily account for my philosophy requirements. So now this semester I'm taking 19 credits to make up for some last semester. So honestly, it would just be a, my only bad experience in my sophomore year. With the advising center. Aside from that, they've been very understanding, very flexible. A lot of my advisors have really walked me through it, really helped me stay on top of things. You know, being honest, I have failed a class before in my freshman year. Uh, they have been very on top of things, making sure that I'm graduating when I want to graduate, make, telling me what I need to do to graduate when I want to graduate in, in a year and a half. So my experience with the advising center has been relatively good, and I just recommend students to go see your advisor because uh, Abe kind of touched up on it earlier, that some students are like, no, I can do it myself. I'm totally fine with that. I kind of did that because I had family who went here. So I was trying to be uh, a little bit of a know-it-all, which was quite frankly bad of me being like, no, I, I know what classes to take. But when you go to the advising center, you can really benefit from it and find out what what's right for you for your degree and make sure you're, you're graduating when you want to uh, by your typical goal for four years, five years, whatever it may be. Aside from that, there's quite a, a lot of other resources on campus that have been beneficial that I think students should check out. One of them is a student organization. They're called the Alliance of Non-Traditional Students. So one thing about me is I'm a non-traditional student. Uh, non-traditional students are those who came to college either above the age of 24 or below the age of 18. I came to UNLV at 15 because I finished high school at that age. And you know, when I came to UNLV, it, Coming that young, you can kind of feel lost, you can feel isolated, you can feel like you don't necessarily belong. We touched upon imposter syndrome a lot, and the Alliance of Non-Traditional Students really is beneficial. There's so many students, so many workshops, so many panels, and so many resources being offered by them. And I've really met a lot of like-minded individuals, some of which I met this semester, who are 16, 15, 17, others who are in their 20s and 30s. 
and they really just help each other as a community to succeed in college. Uh, you know, one thing that I often see that we don't take into account in diversity is age at UNLV. We talk about cultures and backgrounds, but we don't account for how diverse we are in age. UNLV has a really large non-traditional student uh, population, so that's one resource I highly recommend for all the students who go here. Aside from that, two other resources, just so I don't you know, take up too much time. The first one would be the UNLV Food Pantry. Uh, when I came to UNLV, I did not know this existed at all. And when I found out it existed, I got lost trying to find it. I was literally walking around for two hours in the blatant heat, trying to find out what this food pantry was. I feel like a lot of students could really benefit from this because at the end of the day, there can be a stigma with, you know, feeling afraid to get help, feeling afraid to just get resources if you're really struggling at home or you have a friend or a loved one who is struggling, uh, whatever your situation may be. And the food pantry does help you. They help give you food that is nutritious. They help really give you food that aligns with your diet, whether you're vegetarian, vegan, whatever it may be. And it's open to all UNLV students. I highly recommend checking them out for any student who goes to UNLV. They really do help you if you are, you know, running low on cash because you just paid all your bills and something came up and you need lunch, but you don't have any on you and you don't have any money or you don't have any food at home, you can go to the food pantry and really just get a lot of stuff to help out your friends and your family. Aside from that, another resource that I would say is beneficial in my opinion would be the Dean's Student Advisory Council of the College of Liberal Arts. I'm not sure if other colleges, ha colleges have this as a resource. Uh, I joined the Dean's Student Advisory Council about two years ago actually, right when I graduated high school and they've offered me a lot of resources with you know, making my resume, making my CV, helping me prep for grad school, helping me with mental health. Uh, they've helped all the ambassadors on this council really get through college as well as advise the Dean on you know, what students need, what are colleges specifically facing. I know some colleges are just now looking into launching one similar to the College of Liberal Arts, but that's one resource I highly recommend to any college student. If you join the Dean Student Advisory Council, you'll be able to get help, you know, with a lot of different things, with professionalism, with, you know, getting your job in the workplace, making sure you're on top of your classes, learning what the deans are up to in the offices and what they face on the back end, and really brings the campus together and has really helped me succeed. And it has really helped me, uh, you know, get my job at UNLV in the first place and kind of get to the point of involvement where I'm at now. So those are a few basic resources that I highly recommend. Lastly, and this is just going to be a shameless plug of CSUN again, I highly recommend students seeking resources from CSUN. Uh, not going to lie, I knew what CSUN was when I came to UNLV. I had siblings who were in CSUN a decade ago, but I've had friends who have come to UNLV who didn't know what CSUN was, didn't know we offered scholarships, didn't know the programs and resources we offer to students. Like last semester, we had focus groups. We had all sorts of different things to help these students out. And I just feel that there's a lot of students who come here and they're like, student government, no. And they already kind of could have, you know, a stigma on it, a stereotype in high school. But from everybody I've met at UNLV, CSUN really offers so many resources to help you get through college. Uh, like Nathan, who is in CSUN, the committee recently passed a scholarship for non-traditional students. So I just recommend to all students, check out CSUN as a resource as well. But those are a few things that have really benefited me on this. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> last but not least, uh, for me, um, I'm going to try to keep it a little bit short on my resources. So I'll go over resources first. And one of the ones that helped me the most that I remember out of the three years I've been here at UNLV was um, this program hosted by the SDSJ, which was um, a Black space. Um, Black Students Matter Space. It was called Black Space at first, but I guess they changed the name for it. During the height of 2019, I was a I was an incoming freshman. I had my fall semester, and then I also lived um, off campus. So I was living at Rebel Place. So I wasn't with my family, and I wasn't with any friends on campus. I was in an apartment. I had a roommate, but she did her own thing and had her own life. So after when 2019, um, COVID-19 hit, I was in an apartment by myself and I was also leaving a very um, traumatic intern position that I had that was very damaging to myself. And so having all that at the same time and also dealing with, you know, being African-American in the United States during one of the most high in, you know, political situations and police brutality, I got an email about <laughs> Black Space and I read it and I went to it. And it's basically a Zoom call with um, two people from the SDSJ, so Dr. Crabb and Dr. Alford. 
and you just sit for an hour and it'll be students from all across UNLV who are basically dealing with the same thing of just being African-American in this state of time that we're dealing with. And it helped me not feel so alone because I was at that time quarantining by myself at such a young age and not being able to contact your friends or at the time having your friends contact you about how you're feeling about everything that's going on and not really being able to communicate myself. So that was one of the best resources that impacted my life. And currently I'm not able to go as much because I am busy, but I would highly recommend it to any student that's feeling a little bit marginalized and just needs someone to talk to. That's a great space to go to. Another resource that helped me was recently I'm having night classes. I've never had night classes before. And so having to walk across campus at night is actually pretty scary. <laughs> I'd never experienced it before. And um, the police department here on UNLV actually has an initiative that they worked out with CSUN um, University Initiatives, and that's the uh, Rebel Rise, I guess the Rebel Pickup. So you can go on the Rebel Safe app and request someone to come and pick you up on a golf cart and take you to your car. So I also recommend that now that we're all back on campus, that's not something that I had to worry about before and I definitely have to now. So those are the two that I would definitely encourage as well as all the other ones that my co-panelists have said. When it comes to advising, I've been pretty lucky. <laughs> and after hearing everyone's stories, I feel like, I don't know if I'm doing it correctly. I am a honors college student as well as a lead business school student. I've only talked to my honors college advisor. <laughs> I don't know if that's good or bad. But shout out to Derek Somner. He is the best. I will email him about anything and everything, especially because I was trying to study abroad this upcoming fall semester, but it did get canceled, sadly. And so working with him during the summer and just sending him an email like, hey, is this OK? Does this check out? And he was always very responsive to me. He would email me in the matter of at most three days or I would just send him a copy of the classes that I might be taking and he would just say yes and no to everything like that. So me and him have a very good um, relationship. And so far we're on the right track for me to be graduating. And I'm very lucky, lucky and blessed to have an advisor who is responsive, who knows what they're doing and um, is getting me on the right track. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, let's open it up to our online participants. Anybody have a question for us, for the students here? So Melissa, um, Dr. Katie Kamachi um, got kicked off of Zoom and blocked out from rejoining, but um, I did post a, a message from her. She just wanted to um, let our students know that she thinks that they're awesome. <laughs> I think the same thing. I got the goosebumps over here on my end. Um, she says, she's asking, can she take, um, take the students out on a tour with her? She says, seriously, I needed this to understand a bit more of the dynamics on campus and I am in love with UNLV even more. And she's only been here for a week. That is awesome. Very nice. Um, any other questions from our uh, participants? Students available, you can ask them anything. <laughs> I so appreciate you all being so open and really sharing um, your, your thoughts, your experiences so openly. Thank you so much for that. Um, that was everything I was gonna ask. <laughs> all right, well, thank you so much. Let's give a hand. We'll stop the recording. Say goodbye online. Abe and Nathan, thank you.